Welcome to the last session of the day. I hope you enjoyed the uh, conference. I hope the food outside is good. I miss that. Um, I'll, I'll try, to, um, try to make this conversation less boring um, because every time people talk about performance, they tend to actually go away from the conversation. Um, yeah, and then, then um, I try to make it really simple and uh, um, Drupal developers, this is not really hardcore um, technical session. This is more of a um, foundation introduction of how the website works and why we think the performance matters. Um, and we're talking from the enterprise level, um, not from a personal blog website perspective. Um, let me get started. Uh, my name is Josh and I'm based in Canberra. I'm always based in Canberra. I've been working in the government for my entire life. Um, I started in Drupal 5.7, uh, which is quite old. Um, and the agenda for today, um, we'll talk about web performance. We need to know what is web performance and why do we care about web performance. Um, then we will need to dive into the journey of the request um, to see okay, how things are working at the background after you actually hit the enter in, the, in your browser, uh, where your request is going. And surely when we talk about performance, uh, there is cache involved and how cache is working in different layer, uh, in browser layer, Drupal layer, then, then we have a working Drupal website. Um, then people will talk about CDN, um, and we all know Vanish, and then what's the difference between Vanish and Redis? Um, then we all know the meme, or you don't know, it's from the old Drupal days, that people saying that don't panic and clear the cache. I believe the developers still saying that. Um, um, we will worry about that later. And then um, after everything, uh, we will hopefully we come up with the best practice on the uh, performance oriented architecture. Um, and decoupled Drupal is a quite popular topic these days. It's been around for, for years. And we will talk about decoupled Drupal from the, pers uh, from the performance perspective. All right. What is web performance? I got this from Google Gemini because these days you don't know answers. You just use the AI, right? Um, then um, it was telling me it's pretty much from the two uh, aspects. One is saying that, oh, you, uh, you request for a website, how long does it take for you to actually see the website, the web page? Or uh, how smooth is that experience? Like you see the working web page, not something like you scroll it, it doesn't move. Um, two, which I think is more important, is the perceived user experience. Is about how you feel about the, 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 the website. The truth can be, the website is not performing well from the objective measurement. But the user feel like it's performing well, somehow. Um, which is um, quite important. And I, I think the perceived user experience takes a higher priority. Why? You have poor website performance, you have bad user experience, then you have a leaving customer. Um, according to the stats, like one in four visitors will leave a site if it takes more than four seconds to load. And what is four seconds to load? You can actually find that from, from Google, and Google actually has a really good tool uh, called Lighthouse in your console, in the Chrome to actually um, tell you um, um, how long does it that the web page to actually paint, and how long does the web page become interactive? And every second delay, that will actually impact the user satisfaction by sixteen percent. That was from last year's stats. Not sure about this year yet. So um, we will talk about the journey uh, of a web request um, to figure that where we can actually improve the user experience. Um, and the web performance from different layer. Um, 
everything starts it with a click, like you have a browser and someone click on the link and click enter in the browser. And your browser will think, what should I do about it? Um, sometimes the browser thinks I don't do anything about it. Um, sometimes, for most of the cases, the browser will actually generate a request with a header. The header will include the, the information that tells where should we, should we actually fetch the content that the, um, the user is asking for. And um, the browser will do certain logic check. Um, well, I will talk about the detail later, but the browser has a local cache version of the response. Um, it will check whether this web page has been downloaded locally. Um, if it has, then it will check some condition whether I should actually fetch the new version of the web page or not. Um, if everything is fine and I don't have to fetch the new version of the web page, I'll just load the, the old version, the cache version. So uh, if you inspect the network um, in, your, in your Chrome or other browser, uh, you may see there's no actual traffic going outside. And before I, I talk about the details on the logic change, uh, I'm going to introduce a, a conception called eTag. Um, eTag, well, a lot of people know what it's about, but just in case, uh, it's an entity tag um, for a HTTP response. Um, it is, we can imagine, it's the ID of a response. Um, it's, you know, that it was an MD5 of a response, and it's, it's a hash of a response. Um, if anything changes in the response, the E tag will change. So, Imagine if you have the last updated time in your response, in your web page, or in your HTTP response. Doesn't have to be in um, in the content; it can be anywhere. If the last update time changed, the e tag will be different. Means that the browser will treat it differently. Now, let's talk about the detail. Um, the browser will ask, "Do we have a cache version first?" If we don't, okay, send it to the target um, and try to get the new response. If we do, um, the browser will check from the previous stored revision of the response. Do we have the, he um, the header indicating that please do not cache this page? If we do, saying that, oh, um, Drupal is telling the browser, no cache, no, don't cache this page. The browser will, will follow that, saying that, okay, uh, we don't cache the page, and we will actually um, send a request to the target um, with the e-tag. Um, so uh, there's, a, there's a value in the, in the header called uh, if none match, means that it's asking the target whether the e-tag is different. I will talk about what if it's different, what if the same later. And um, if Cache control, no cache equals no, means that, okay, we cached it. Um, the browser will check with the max age. I'm pretty sure you guys are familiar with this too, because in your performance setting page in Drupal, there are settings for that. And to make it clear, um, cleared, that's not really for your web browser. Oh, that's not for your web server or Drupal to control the cache. That's indicating the browser or any upstream CDN or any entity that how do we actually handle the cache? Um, and uh, the browser will ask for the um, max age. How long do we actually um, cache it? And if the time is within uh, last uh, the max the the cache hour, um, it will actually load the cache version. Um, if it's not, it will actually send a request to the target um, with the e tag. And here we have to talk about another conception uh, in the header called uh, if modified since, because this is the indicator of last time when the web page was updated in the server. And uh, the browser will use this value and the max cache, uh, the max age, cache age value to calculate uh, whether it's expired or not. So this is only high level of the logic, how the browser is, is handling the caching. There are many other things. I don't really have the enough space to actually draw the diagram here. So you can imagine your browser is actually doing a really good job to actually uh, cache the website. It's by default. 
unless in the console you actually take no cache for the debug purpose, but we reckon you just keep it on. Um, when the response, when the, the server received the, the request, and able to actually compare the e-tag, whether this resource has changed or not. If it's not changed, it will return HTTP 304. 304 is a really small junk, small um, piece of, of uh, response indicating the browser, okay, this resource, this web page hasn't changed at all. I'm not giving you the full response. There's no content, there's no web page in the response. Simply indicating it's not changed. If it's not changed, the browser will render the cache version. If it's changed, then the browser will actually uh, make further call to back to the, uh, the target and fetch the uh, updated version. And that's, uh, that's uh, similar to um, uh, there's no cache version. So this is already quite complicated. And imagine um, developers actually debugging a, a change and we haven't seen the change and people say, no, I already cleared the cache, why I haven't seen it? Maybe try in, in incognito mode, then uh, the new browser will actually fetch it for you. Um, all right, so enough with browser. In the best case, the browser actually send the request out and um, it will be delivered to the DNS service and the DNS knows, okay, where is the URL, which, which IP is that, and it will be redirect to the, uh, the web server. And what happened within the web server? So this is a really simple case. We haven't got CDN everything in the middle yet. This is simply browser to Drupal, right? So in the, in the server, we have Nginx or Apache, and we have Drupal running in it, or Drupal will do. Again, from really, really high level, I'm not going into the detail, I'm going to show you a really complicated diagram um, after this slide. Um, so what Drupal will do is it will check the database, and uh, we have a number of tables in database, um, you know, starting with a cache and underscore, and whatever. Um, it will fetch the data from the cache table first. It will check whether um, the entity we're trying to render is already cached in the cache table. Um, if it is, fantastic. I will just render from the cache table. If it's not, then I will actually conduct a really, really complicated SQL join tables and grab the content from the fields, from node, from whatever table, right? Um, this is by default Drupal doing that. And you can't really disable that. You, uh, Drupal is doing that regardless. And this is what I was talking about. Um, the real uh, Drupal render flow diagram is for Drupal 8. So that's the version I can find, but I'm pretty sure uh, it will be similar in Drupal 10. Um, there are much more complicated logic checking in it. Um, but from high level, it's checking the cache table. Now we have a simple architecture. Uh, browser is doing its caching. And if it's not caching, send it to the web server. Then the web server send it to the database server, and database server doing the caching too. So we have two layers of caching, Drupal um, or the database and the browser, which is fine. We're happy. Um, only if um, we have uh, too many requests from different browsers. Um, if we have, talking about enterprise level, we have too many requests requesting different URLs um, to Drupal. Uh, means that it will all go to the web server and it will go to the database server to actually fetch, even if it's from the cache table, it's still reaching the database table, right? Um, and I think you may need to actually find a friend from outside um, DevOps to actually talk about the auto-scaling and, um, and manage service on, on Drupal hosting. So they will actually handle the auto-scaling, otherwise simply many requests will actually crash your server. Then people start to talk about CDN. Uh, what is CDN? I'm pretty sure you all know that. So content distribution network is uh, a cloud uh, computing uh, at the edge, closing to your network. Um, it will actually store the, uh, web, so, uh, the web pages uh, at the edge, um, which means that when you make a request, it will reach the CDN's resource and the CDN will give what you want. Um, the traffic will not 
go into your original uh, web server if there's is cached. Um, in the diagram, it's simply adding a green bar between the browser and the web server. And with the CDN properly configured, um, you can actually cache up to like 95% of traffic. Um, so the browser will only reach the CDN um, and most of the content will be served by the CDN. Only small parts of the content will, will come from the web server, which will happen. And the CDN is always managed service and, and all the big companies are doing that. Um, if you, you guys use um, GAPSMS, uh, Akamai is, is a CDN you guys are using. And what the CDN can do, um, apart from serving the content, uh, is behaving like a firewall. Um, you can configure the traffic in CDN, the firewall. Um, if there's a DDoS, for example, it will know it. It will ban the IP. Um, there's no traffic coming through the CDN. And you can actually create custom rules, um, such as, okay, if there's a request for a particular URL and you know some custom logic on that URL, and you can actually make the CDN to redirect that request to somewhere else. Um, or uh, the CDN knows the, uh, the cookies or the tags or, or any information carried um, from the request header. It will actually check the header and it will actually do some customization to massage the request. Um, the last thing, the CDN can actually store some files from media files at the edge. Uh, means that if you have some static image icons, uh, you don't want to actually serve from your web server, you can directly upload it to the CDN and it will be served by the CDN. Now, Vanish. Um, pretty sure everyone already knows Vanish. Um, um, Vanish is a application sitting in front of Nginx. It can be in the same server with Nginx or it can be in the dedicated server. In front of Nginx is a caching software that uh, request, uh, that receive the request from the upper stream, can be from CDN or from the browser, and it will actually uh, check whether the, the response is already cached. Um, it's using uh, caching within its memory, which means that it's really fast um, because the response is from the memory. And um, similarly to, um, to the CDN, you can configure Vanish with all the custom logic, like uh, how do we want to distribute um, the, um, uh, the request, uh, how do I want to uh, pass it or block it or you know, uh, doing whatever proxy work, uh, you can do it from the VCL. Um, pretty sure there's, if you want to talk about the details, there's another, another presentation about Vanish um, for it. Um, then um, this is uh, where Vanish will play in the end-to-end -end diagram. Uh, we see that Vanish will sit in front of Nginx and well, I'm just putting 90% of the traffic if it's configured properly. Um, there are tons of traffic can be served from Vanish. So that there's another layer. You don't really have the request to actually reaching your web server. Now, uh, the last component in the diagram, uh, Redis. Um, Redis is a um, content store. It's a NoSQL database uh, in memory. Uh, people can use it to store anything. Um, and in, in general um, web app or, or the website world, people use Redis to actually store the um, um, SQL query result. Um, like, oh, you run whatever SQL query, then the result is in Redis, and Redis will actually um, give the result instead of running the query again um, in the database. Um, in Drupal world, it's even better. Uh, the, the Redis module actually moved the cache tables, uh, the content of the Drupal cache tables into Redis uh, NoSQL database, which means that um, in the uh, previous diagram, uh, when we have Drupal, uh, Drupal contact database and fetch the content from the, the cache table, now it's fetching the cache content from the Redis NoSQL database. Um, which means that um, less traffic to the database server. Now, we have a end-to-end um, -end diagram, and you can see that we have one, two, three, four, five, um, five potential places that we have the caching. And 
that way, even we, and also we have the web server and database server auto scaling enabled, uh, our website is pretty safe um, with all kind of like a traffic coming in. Now, do we think that we don't need to panic if we clear the cache? And when we run Drupal CR, for example, um, if we run Drupal CR in our prod, I forgot that one. Um, if we run Drupal CR in, in prod, means that all the cache will be, will be cleared, means that suddenly all the traffic will come into your web server and, and database server. And means that all the structure we put in front of the Nginx server, Redis, Vanish, they're not, uh, they're not working uh, because it's, uh, nothing is cached. So we don't want to actually clear the cache and um, we need to worry if we clear the cache in prod. But what, how do I see the change? Like the developer actually have a new function in the page and um, I want to see the change in the page and you telling me you don't really clear the cache. How do I see it? Um, normally that's from the testers. Um, that's why well, we have to talk about cache tag. Um, I'm really glad that Dries mentioned about cache tag in the keynote um, because cache tag I was I was going to repeat in my presentation multiple times. Um, cache tag was introduced uh, in Drupal 8, which is a long time ago. And But for developers from the Drupal 7 or even previous world, they have no idea what is Drupal, what is cache tag, and they, they, they program the way they like. So it's, it tends to be forgotten by um, long time Drupal developers. Um, <laughs> Um, what does Drupal tag does? Um, Drupal tag is kind of like a flagging for your Drupal entity. Um, is adding the dependencies to the render rate. So everyone knows that you know um, everything is render rate in Drupal, uh, even so small uh, entity uh, or a page, everything is render rate. Actually, add a dependency to the render rate, saying that okay, this current entity is depending on the content of this tag. So if this tag changes or someone saying that you should clear, uh, someone touch the tag, this tag render array or entity will need to be cleared. The cache needs to be cleared. Drupal is doing that by default. We know, we know, have, we don't have any custom module doing that or, or country module doing Drupal core is doing that, which is really, really awesome. Drupal is already doing this smart. Um, solution to actually handle the cache. We need to leverage from it. Pretty sure all the people have been talking about this for, for a long time. And um, because render array is in entity level and we can have multiple entities in the same page and means that the tags in each entity will bubble up to the URL level. Um, I will give an example um, later on how, how does the bubble up works. And with this, we will enable selective Drupal uh, cache clear, which means that we don't run uh, drag CR. We automatically clear the cache when we need to, and we only clear, clear the cache for particular page. Um, this is an example of um, cache tags. Um, for example, a current page uh, is node one. Uh, node one will be the, the, the tag. Uh, whenever the current um, node one is changed, then Drupal will clear the cache of everything tagged with node one. And also, uh, node list article is, uh, is a tag. If, um, anything like uh, any article in website, um, in article content type is changed, then the page with this tag will be cleared from the cache. Um, similarly, the entity type ID the entity. So it's actually applied to all kind of like entities. Um, give you a real life example. So we have a page, it's a landing page, and we have a uh, feature news uh, at, the, at the middle. 
and we have uh, a view, an article, news article view at the bottom, and on the right hand side we have the user information. Um, the feature news is uh, Note 5, and the uh, news article view is actually showing uh, Note 1, 2, 3, and the user information is uh, UID 2, and what happened to the, uh, the tag. So the tag, the minimum number of tag we will have is Note 4, Note 5, and all the article notes because we have a view in there and user 2. Means that if Note 4 changes, if Note 5 changes, if all the article notes change, only one of them, only one of them changes, if the user profile for user 2 changes, the current page cache will be cleared by Drupal automatically. We don't have to do anything. And this is all default from the Drupal core. Um, when we actually develop, developing a custom page or, or um, custom solution, uh, we need to be careful of adding too many tags uh, because there's a limit from the CDN, um, from Akamai, for example, uh, will complain about the size of the, um, the cache tag. And if you put way too many cache tag in there, um, um, CDN won't be able to handle that. So we just need to keep that in mind. And we have the purge module, and we have a, a bunch of other purge-related module, depending on the purge module, to actually integrate with the Varnish and CDN. With the purge module configured, what we can do is we can automatically clear the re required page um, from Drupal. So Drupal will initi the, uh, initiate the, page, uh, the cache clearing, and it will trigger the cache clearing in Varnish, and the CDN. The purge module will send signal to Vanish and the CDN saying that, okay, please clear this particular page because it's tagged, um, it's all started by Drupal and this, um, we don't have to do any other customization. Debugging. Um, as I mentioned that we need to actually use the cache tag and um, Drupal automatically will clear the cache and um, purge module will, use, will work with Vanish and CDN. Um, and to debug whether the page is cached or not, check your console, uh, browser console, uh, check the response header, uh, whether your browser is actually sending the request out or uh, it's not. Um, then you need to actually clear the browser cache. And also remember that the CDN actually treats the query strings as different URL. So um, if your query string is different, um, then it will, it will init initiate a new request. For example, if you think your, your page is cached by Akamai, you just add um, question mark something equals to something that will actually break the cache. Um, some tips, uh, please use Drupal to render as much as possible. Uh, try not to use, so for the uh, static content like news or, or all sorts of content, please use Drupal to render because Drupal already cache quite smartly and you have all the software in the stack to cache for you. So why, why not leveraging from it? Um, de developers, always add cache tag in your render array. You, when, you, when you render, you have the cache in your mind and you need to understand oh, how long do I need to cache for it? When do I need to clear the cache for this particular content? Otherwise, um, it will be cached forever. You only use a front-end solution. For example, you use React call, uh, when there's a global value that is constantly changing, someone wants to display the server time in the web page. Um, you don't want to do that, but if you, if some, the requirement is really like that, you, you don't want to use um, Drupal to do that. You rather to actually have an API to actually show the dynamic value and have a React or JavaScript, whatever, in the browser to actually contact the API directly without going through Drupal because your Drupal is busy enough. And, if you want to integrate with other third-party API which serve the dynamic values, you also want to go from the browser directly to your, your API endpoint, uh, not through Drupal. Uh, and nowadays, personalization uses cookies and uh, front-end. Uh, JavaScript actually fetch different content based on different cookies. So uh, you don't want to actually cache it for different different cookies. Um, um, yeah, so... Um, Personalization need to be from the front end. Um, if if you're going through Drupal, then um, it's likely that uh, it will be cached, and then uh, you won't really see the personalization. 
um, one of the challenge, well, after I talked about that, is that if you have a really dynamic uh, URL argument, like location, country, region, district, suburb, then you want to show the detail of that, um, CDN and Banish will be passed because the, the URL is different. Um, and there can be millions of different URLs. And um, you, won't, you won't cache it. That's why when you have to think about the front-end solution, that you have to move the details from the endpoint. And uh, using your browser to actually call the endpoint, um, then you can cache the endpoint, and you can only invalidate the endpoint result uh, when it's needed. Right. OK. Definitely. Is the couple of better in performance? Yes or no? Yes or no? Initial response size may be smaller or, or larger or similar. Um, and response size is much smaller um, than, than coupled Drupal. Um, but what you need to be careful is if you change the layout of the website in decoupled Drupal, you need to clear the cache for the entire site. Then all the traffic will go in. And if you, if you have all the, the value pulling directly to, the, to your browser, you need to be careful of the CPU usage in your browser because there will be crazy state management in your browser. All the React is doing to manipulate the data within your local browser. Something missing. I'm not, I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> Reference. <laughs> Some diagrams are from there. Question. Find me offline. <laughs>